Jesus. Okay, howdy. So, yeah, in yeah. this Thursday, we have a quiz. So as usual, you can take a video about this topic. So in this week, the quiz is about visit the page below, which is project358.com uh, post. And if you visit such a page, then you can see a lot of polls in here, right? About the 2020 presidential election. And, okay, let's see a little bit. Yeah, closed. Okay. So in this, for example, the first one is a presidential approval poll. So it is about the, whether you approve the action of Donald Trump or not. And this is uh, done by, the first one is done by Rasmus and Reports for Proofs of Opinion Research. And the, this C plus is kind of ratio, which is given by Pipe 38, whether they are reliable or not. So in case um, some of them has B or C, but some of them has C minus, some of them has A, but some of them has A plus. So these are all depends on whether the site Pipe 38 uh, judges that whether this study at uh, this point is reliable or not. So, what you need to do is just pick a, uh, one poll from this page. So any poll is uh, just uh, good. So for example, I just choose this one most university poll. Then if you choose such a poll, then you can see all the, you know, the result and their methodology to get this result, right? And to see this, you can answer some of the question, yeah, in here. So first of all, please let me know what is the population of the poor. So for example, in this case, in this poll is definitely the registered uh, voters in the United States because it is about the polls about the, uh, whether Trump wins in direction or by the wins in direction. And what is the sample of the poll? Then you can see such a sample in the methodology or in other pages. So for example, in this case, you can see the methodology page. Give me a second, see, it is a little bit long. Oh, here, I just skipped it. Oh yeah, here. So you can see that this methodology says that it was sponsored by some polling institute from something to something and statewide random sample of some voters in Pennsylvania and include some contacts and how get they uh, contact us, uh, does, uh, this polar and interviewers and by cell phone or in English, right? So there are a lot of information about this poll uh, came here. So in this case, yeah, especially for the things in the A plus or A is definitely much more easier for you because they contain some information about the methodologies. But you can choose another one. For example, if you choose, let's choose one C or B example. So it is from the CNN. So in this case, again, in the overview, it says that they uh, interviewers, uh, interviews were conducted from October 1 to 4, and sample of 1,000 respondents and land drawing total, and Point total and some errors on designs, right? So from this information, you can answer those questions. What is the population of the poor? What is the sample of the poor? And is it a convenient sample? If you think yes, then please explain it. If you think no, it is not a convenient sample, then just explain it using that um, information you can get from the Google. 
or is it voluntary response sample? Then again, please explain why it is voluntary sample or not by information in the poll. And the next question is that, does this sample have a bias which is not presented in three and four, especially under coverage, which deals it in the last time, or non-response? Then again, you can explain it using your reasoning. Maybe sometimes there are no information to judge this, then just say that there are not enough information to judge this bias, so then you're okay. And lastly, uh, if you suppose that you are a gambler for this uh, the presidential election and you need to bet someone who wins or not, then will you bet the winner of the election according to the poll you choose? Just explain it with your reasoning from the, based on the answers from one to five, right? So, Again, I think that two or three minutes are enough for yeah, answering those questions. In video, please do not exceed in five minutes. And again, you need to include the, your name on your video, usually. And from, and from one and two, you can just answer, you know, just without any reasoning, right? Because I can find it in the report, big report. but to get the pre-credit, you need to explain why you think about the answer on number three, from number three to number six, right? So you need to justify your answers from number three to six, and especially to answer five. Uh, when you think that this poll is not have any bias, then please just explain why you think that this doesn't have any bias. Otherwise, you need to explain why this poll has bias by your you know, own, own reasoning. And, and when you're done to take the picture, then please unload it on your Google Drive account or uh, Zoom account or YouTube account. Anything is just fine. But do not unload it on the eCampus directory because last time I had also trouble to get the video from eCampus because eCampus is very slow to download some videos. So please. Uh, Please upload it for your own Google account or own YouTube account and just submit your link in the assignment page, right? Then you're okay. Okay, do you have any question on this case? Okay, so the due date is uh, Thursday night as usual. So I think two days are enough for taking video for two minutes. So I hope this works for, yeah. Actually, this is kind of application keys for what we learned from the lecture to estimate the winner of the election, right? Okay. okay, do you have any other question? Okay, yeah. David, I will email this to, uh, I will email this, the context of this quiz for all students, yes. Okay, then let's go back to the, our lecture. So, Today, yeah, from the rust, we deal with how to get the sample and how, what kind of bias in the sample can occur. So now we know how can we get the sample in the real uh, study, right? So there are two ways to do that. So first one is experiment and the other one is observational study, right? So we will run experiment in the section five and observational study in section six. So when you just you know, observe some data, then we, can, we didn't know which one is the experimental variable or which one is the response variable, right? So to get rid of this kind of you know, confusion, we can actually do some experiment, right? So what it means is that you can actually import your treatment, a treatment on on individuals in order to observe their responses, right? 
So if you just do the treatment on the individuals, then you know that which one is the explanatory variable and which one is the response variable, right? Because by taking treatment, so what you change the variable is actually the explanatory variable and the responses are definitely response variable. And so the purpose of an experiment is to study whether the treatment causes a change or not, right? But sometimes there are some variables, whether intentionally part of study or not, they, they, they may affect our, you know, experiment. So let's see some example. So, sorry, I, do you have any question? Okay, yeah. So let's see some examples. So we want to, yeah, especially in this COVID-19 case, there are a lot of students actually taking online courses, right? So I want to see that taking online courses can increase their scores on SAT, in, say in high school. I just wanna, if how these online courses affect the score on SAT compared with the case, with face-to-face uh, -face courses, right? So to do this, maybe you can do some experiment, right? right? So you can just make some randomly choosing people and assign that some people take the online courses and some people take the face-to-face -face courses and you can just um, investigate their scores on SAT, right? So then maybe you can just, you know, uh, get the experiment results so between two variables. So say this is variable A and this is variable B, right? But sometimes, for example, yeah, maybe some uh, other, other things, right, that different you know, professors, maybe professors in the rank courses are different with professors in the face-to-face -face courses or different materials or students, effort of the students, level of effort for the, each student. Vary from the, you know, participants, right? So those C1, C2, C3, those things are actually also affect this score on SAT, right? So to get the result that whether A directly affects B or not, we need to get rid of this C1, C2, C3 from our study, right? So for example, you need to uh, make the same professor teaches the same online courses and Facebook page courses. And also you need to uh, make the uh, all professors in the courses use the same materials. And also you need to make all students just study uh, only eight hours in the day and they need to go play after that or well, something like that, right? So those C1, C2, C3, those uh, variables which are affects on your result which is not in the experimental variable are called confounded. So in this case, the variables which intentionally part of study or not are said to be compounded when their impact on the outcome cannot be distinguished from each other, right? So to deal with such a compounded, yeah, so, so our objective is just get rid of this compounded variable to, uh, to to measure how the variable A impact on how variable B. And to do this, we need to use the control group that does not receive the treatment, right? So what we did is that just, if we wanna uh, measure how this online course is affect on school and SAT, then we need to put some other papers 
taking the face-to-face -face courses and just, comp just, just make sure that half of them should take online courses with the same compounding level. So for example, half of them, yeah, as I said earlier, different, maybe we can just make all of the, of the same professor teaches the same courses in online or face-to-face courses. Also, we need to um, make that average level of approach of the students are the same for both groups and so on, right? So by this way, we can see that the control group is actually our kind of, the, you know, contrary to our original group. So we can, um, and then we can actually uh, compare their result to get the conclusion from whether A affects B or not, right? So a controlled experiment uses your control group. And if this group picked a random, then you have a randomized comparative result and you can just have some comparative experiment, right? So these are just the name of experiment. And uncontrolled experiment lacks a control group. So usually, definitely it is recommended to get the control group for experiment, but sometimes we cannot get such a uncontrolled experiments in the history. So for example, if you just want to, you know, know about the, so for example, if you just want to know about the how recession in 208, so recession in 208 is on one variable, and it affects, for example, employment rate. So to deal with how recession is, yeah, just do it, 200. So if you just wanna want to know re how recession uh, affects on employment rate, then you cannot do controlled experiment, right? So if you, want to control the experiment, then you need to choose some countries that you need to bear about this recession and you need to choose the other countries that you are not, yeah, you, you didn't have any recession. Then definitely people in the control group do not like this experiment, right? So nobody agrees to get that their economy are in the experiment, right? So in this case, even if we know that yeah, it, is not, it is an uncontrolled experiment, but we need to study based on that information without control group, right? So that kind of situation happens when the experiment is a little bit difficult, a controlled experiment is a little bit difficult to uh, done it, so to be done it. So yeah, so that's why we also use uncontrolled experiment in, in the usual situation. So what you need to run in this chapter is to figure out which system, which design of the experiment is controlled experiment or randomized comparative experiment or uncontrolled experiment, right? So the, think about this first example. So students in a college math classes are allowed to choose if they would like to attend the tradition lecture class or a self-paced online class, right? So at the end of semester, the final exam grades are compared and it is found that the average in the traditional lecture group was higher than the self-paced group, right? So traditional lecture groups, the average of the traditional lecture group score is higher than the, that of self-paced group, right? So from this result, can you say that the traditional lecture is more effective than the self-paced method? Raise your hand if you think that, yeah, traditional lecture is more effective from this result. Raise your hand that if this is not yeah, effective experiment. Okay, great. Why do you think that? Okay, yeah, you first. Yeah, definitely it's not the same, but the first reason is that 
it's not the same people. But why they are not the same people? Okay. That's great answer, yes. So because they have choice, right? It is not randomized, randomly distributed, right? So because they have choice, so their preference actually, yeah. Okay. Preference uh, is different, right? So the group who attends to treasure lecture class <laughs> has preference and it is definitely deeper yeah. than the group who attends the self-paced online courses. So it means that two popular, uh, two groups are definitely different people, right? Not the same. So maybe and maybe those preference affects on their no. their uh, scores. So that's why we can say that it is no. So okay, oh, thank you. Okay, and is there any other reason that we need to um, be, be sorry? Yeah, is there any other reason we need to cannot conclude such a things? Yes, as Morgan says that, yeah, can there be bias in experiment or yeah? in is that it restricts to the sampling so yes so there may be some bias on sampling so for example in a college yeah this is only done for on college right college is not randomly choose right so So maybe some of the you know college in other in other college there are some other students in here and in the you know for example in, maybe in the Texas A and M then every student actually works very you know industriously so definitely you had there are no difference between those groups but some other colleges may have for example Texas Austin may have such a you know not that good you know, uh, preference on studying this. So maybe just experiment on one college is not enough for getting the result or getting the conclusion. And some other reasons that so their professors are different. Yeah, which I already mentioned in here. So, and yeah, there are several reasons we can get to be suspicious about this result, right? So in this case, so you no, know, it may have bias. So we cannot conclude directly. Because of these reasons, right? Does it make sense? What do you have any question? Oh, so Morgan, yes. Yeah. So this experiment has bias, especially, yeah, to get such an experiment, they need to make the students randomly distributed for each method, traditional lecture or self-paced online course but they can choose, so that's why, yeah, that's the main reason that this experiment is actually biased. So to deal with such a, you know, bias and to get rid of these things, then first of all, you need to make sure that Colleges are also randomly chosen. Randomly chosen. And students are randomly chosen. 
for each group. So in control group or in the you know experiment uh, experimental group. So not their choice, but by you know just random DCT by the uh, observers. And maybe you can say that a professors are restricted to teach the same material, right? And so on, right? So these are the ways to make the experiment is more randomly given for each group so that we can just get rid of those compounded variables, right? Okay, do you have any question on this? Great, and see the next example. So watch your deep flash for effect, right? Did you heard about the first ray path? So when you actually in the, you know, in the war, uh, when you, if you are a soldier and if you get hurt from enemies, then a lot of uh, the, the doctors actually gives you just a pill uh, without any effect, right? So it is just fake pill, so. So that just make sure that the patient believes that this pill works for their health. But actually these are fake pill, but sometimes this fake pill works. This is called flush for effect, right? So yeah, it is just effect of a dummy treatment. So dummy treatment is actually just make believe that the subject believes that Actually, they are treated by some something, right? But actually, it is not. So, but it sometimes it works. So, these are needed to compare with, compare with why that actually how the variable affects on the other variable, and how the dummy variable also affects on other variable. Because sometimes people are you know changed by their belief, right? So, if they believe that they are treated well, then sometimes they just act well. So to avoid such a compounding uh, variable, we just need to be careful about the, this flush for effect, right? So in case of, especially these are uh, used for digital medicine experiments. So in this case, we just use double blind test or double blind experiment. So in that case, Neither the experimental subjects nor the observers know which treatment is the subjects given, right? So sometimes we just hide that whether you are on subject or not. So there are some, yeah, some, some example about such an experiment is that, yeah, actually a lot, some, someone in their uh, researchers in education actually wants to know the expectation of teacher, how the expectation of teacher affects the scores of students, right? So to deal with this, just pick up group A and B and teachers in group A, the researchers say that, says that actually they teach your genius students, right? They teach genius students. So, and B says that they teach uh, just ordinary students. However, actually A and B actually just deal with the same students, right? 
but it at the different subject, but they just deal with the same students. So to do this, actually our subject, which is in this case is teacher, do not know that whether they are in the experiment or not, right? So they just even yet don't expect that they are actually treated or not because they are actually fakely assigned to just random students. So this kind of situation is called double blind because uh, these subjects do not know whether they are treated or not. And also observers in this case, yeah. Yeah, the researchers also, in, the, in this case, students, sorry. Students do not know whether they are actually teaching from a, one, a teacher who treated or not, right? So in this case, we are called double blind experiment, right? So these are the, some cases of double blind experiment. So let's see some other examples. So students in a dorm were offered free vitamins in one semester and the number of sick days of all the students was tracked, right? So at the end of semester, the average number of sick days for the students who took the free vitamin was lower than those who did not take the vitamins, right? From this, can you conclude that the vitamin keeps students from getting sick? Can you think that is it, the question answer is yes or no? Great. Yeah, that's, so what, oh, sorry, what is your name? Okay, as Katrin says, yeah. Thank you, Katrin. Says that yeah, it is no, because some students, yeah, has, uh, have already other symptoms or diseases, right? So also maybe other students take a flu shot or some vaccines. So some other students also just some, you know, it is, or some other students are just, you know, healthy, right? Some students may have it. as here then. Others, right? So from this, just from this kind of experiment, we cannot conclude that whether vitamin keeps students from getting sick or not, right? To get such a result, then what we need to do is first of all, definitely choose students with the similar, uh, similar medical histories. So for example, if a student who get the vitamins are actually students who got the, some serious diseases in the past, then definitely it is not fair to conclude such a thing. So we need to choose the student with medical, similar medical history for this experiment. And also just, and let all the students, all students be treated for other vaccines, right? So for example, if you just experiment all the students, then you may make sure that all students get the same flu shot or all students get to do not get any flu shot like this, right? So you need to just um, make sure that all students are to be treated at the same, you know, treated by the same medicine or same things, right? other vaccines or medicines, right? Okay. 
And also, also that if you just add something, then that all students have the same level of exercises, especially in this kind of you know, pandemic season. If you just are in the room and do not exercise at all, then definitely you are much more not healthier than other people who just do exercise regularly. So you need to control those, such a behavior for students in the living on dorm, right? So those are actually, you can think about how to make this experiment. Uh, it works for, to conclude, get the desired results, right? Okay. Do you have any question on this experiment? What change it? Okay, great. So even if you are using the simple random survey, but then users can vary due to different subjects and children. So we need to figure out that when this experiment get the desired result or not, and we will run it in the chapter 6, 7.7 .7 about the, what, what is called statistically significant. But just read it prep box right now because we need some other concepts to figure out whether some experiment is gives us statistic, statistically significant result or the other state uh, or not right yes. I missed the s so statistically significant sorry okay do you have any question? Okay, then let's do it this number six. So as I said earlier, the one way to get such your data is your experiments, but sometimes experiments are not possible to do it. So in that case, we can use the observational studies, right? So an observational study is a passive study of a variable of interest. So the study does not attempt to influence the response and is meant to describe a group or situation, right? So it means that the major difference between experiment and observational studies that is that actually in the experiment, the researcher actually treat some subject differently, right? But in case of observation studies, researchers just don't do anything, right? They just observation, right? So that's the difference between experiment and observation studies. And there are two kind of observation studies, right? The first one is called prospective study. And the other one is retrospective study. And as these names actually mean that the prospective study is observation study that let code slowly developing effect of a group of subject over a long time, right? So it is kind of just start with some at the some point and just track what kind of you, what the what the subject changes during the time, right? But in case of retrospective study, is just collect all the interviews or collect all the information from the past to conclude some uh, some result, right? So maybe for example, yeah, this uh, actually example 6.2 is actually example of the prospective study. So think about this 10 year look at all low birth weight babies is performed to determine if birth weight affects IQ and performance in elementary school, right? And to do this, children and are identified in hospitals at birth and their performance is tracked until they are 10 years old, right? So in this case, it is actually observational study, which is prospective, right? Because we are just tracking their result in some uh, long year basis from the start, right? So it's just example or prospective. observation or study.
And I just want to give you an example about this retrospective study. Uh, Morgan says that could you compare them to be a closed VS open study? Uh, in what sense is closed or open, Morgan? Oh yes, so prospective is still running VS. Retrospectives, the info can be changed or the object. Yes, you're right. So yes, in that sense, yeah, prospective is just kind of open study and yeah, uh, in retrospective is kind of closed study because in case of retrospective, yeah, actually things are not changed, right? But sometimes this uh, retrospective studies are also things are a little bit changed. For example, what the economist really wants to know is what kind of the variable actually brings us the great recession in 1920s, right? Maybe you heard about this, that the, uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually got up and saved America from the you know, you know, great recession in 1920s using the UD, or UD policies or like that. But to deal with this, definitely again, as I said in earlier that yeah, we cannot do just make a recession on our economy and just track the record how this uh, recession is bring or like that, right? Because nobody agrees about that kind of experiment or that kind of prospective study. So in that case, what you need to do is actually just use interviews or records occurred in 1920s to conclude those things, right? So I think that it's a little bit cruel, but the Prescott, who is actually a Nobel laureate economist, thinks that actually in the 1920s, uh, even for eight year olds kids can work. It is, it, it is legal for company to hire the eight-year-old kids. But at the 1923, actually United States just banned all such hiring for you know, age under the 16th. And Prescott says that that laws actually bring us the Great Recession at 1920s. He actually argues with the, uh, some you know, observational data before the law acted or after the law acted to get to such a conclusion, right? So such a things are called retrospective study, right? So it seems a little bit weird for us to think that, yeah, banning the, uh, the ch children labor brings a recession, but some, you know, sometimes the statistics actually do such a thing, right? So this is a kind of uh, example of retrospective study. Okay, so do you have any question, those observation studies? Okay, good. Okay. Great, then let's do with example 6.3. So all you need to do in this section is that you just read the design of the experiment or design of the study, and you need to figure out the, which one is the experiment or which one is the observation study. And in case of experiment, is it controlled or uncontrolled? Or in case of the observation study, is it prospective or retrospective, right? So in example 6.3, a group of 100 students is randomly chosen and divided into two groups, right? And one group is taught typing using a set of new materials and the other using traditional methods, right? And after this instruction, Typing speeds are compared to determine if the new material improved running, right? So in that case, 
definitely yeah, researchers actually treat the one group to typing special you know, new, new material, but the other groups just using the traditional method. So definitely it is an experiment, right? Because researchers actually uh, let the group do something which is not natural, right? So, and in this case, since we have one group and the other group, so it is definitely control study, right? Because the other group is actually control group, right? In this case. So it is just example of control experiment, right? Okay, does it make sense? Okay, great. Okay, great. So in the number five and number six, we are dealing with the how can we get such a result from experiment or observational study. But in the number seven, we need to figure out that so just assume that we get some results from experimental observation study, then how can we assure, uh, assure that whether our study gives just the reliable conclusion or not if we didn't have any bias? So that's the read in the section seven. So in the section seven, we just run about statistical inference it is just a method drawing conclusion from about the entire population on the basis of data from a sample, right? So as you can see in this lecture and in these courses, it is almost impossible to just get results from all entire population, right? We always need to get some samples of the population instead of the entire population and to get such a sample, then we need to conclude that when we can say that this sample actually uh, depicts the entire population well or not, right? So to deal with this, uh, the statistical inference is just refers the method to get such a conclusion about the population from the sample, right? So in case of statistical inference, the one thing it is a little bit important concept is confidence interval, right? So, confidence interval is a fixed and usually unknown number that this, oh, sorry, oh no, sorry, sorry, it's not confidence interval. So, confidence interval is just uh, confidence interval is just uh, one type of in inference method. So that we will deal with in the section seven and eight. So in the case of this method, we just assume that a parameter, so this is for this prank. So parameter is a fixed and usually unknown number that describes your population. So usually parameter implies this mean or mean of the population or standard deviation of the population. Not only this, but these two things are actually derived in this course because the other statistics like a median or quartiles are definitely much more harder to get the inference. So we already deal with such, a, such two parameters. And statistics, or well, stat, yeah, statistic it is just uh, not plural. So it is a number that describes a sample, right? So in case of mean, or standard deviation of the population is definitely parameter, but mean of sample or standard deviation of the sample are 
a statistic, right? So you can see that actually parameters are some value we want to get, but in practice we cannot get, right? But statistics are some value which is definitely different with parameter, but which is a little bit closer or at least it's some kind of partial information about this parameter, right? So confidence interval method is just a method to get the parameter uh, using statistics, right? So that's the method. So usually when we say about the parameter, then we say about just some letter, but it is about the um, statistic, we just give them help, right? So for example, if the parameter for the portion of success is called P, then the corresponding statistics is called P hat, right? So that's just convention from the statistics. So let's see some example about this. So a survey is sent to 100 employees at a community hospital asking if they support a law requiring motorcycle riders to wear helmet, right? The result indicated that 88% support the law. However, if the actual profession of the community residents who support the law is 72%, then what is the P and what is the P hat? Can you figure out? So the 88% is 88% P or P hat? Okay, is 88% is parameter or statistic? Pardon? Statistic, great, yes. Because this 88% is actually get got from the survey on 100 employees in the community hospital, right? But however, what we actually wanna know is that the actual proportion of the community residents, right? Not only in the hospital, but also in the people in other areas, right? So this 88% is actually statistics, so it should be P hat. And P is 72% in this case, because yeah, it is just given by this example that the actual proportion of the community resident who support the law is 72%. So this is actually parameter, right? Thank you, Madeline. Yes, statistics, yeah. And is that difference in these barriers most likely a result of random chance or a sampling bias? Maybe random chance, but why do you think that? You're right, yes. So. Oh, what is your name? Grace. Grace, Grace says that it maybe is random chance because it is actually, you know, voluntary sample, voluntary response sample, or or maybe they have other options, right? And is there any other question? Could you speak a little bit louder? Yes, could, what is your name? Firo, yeah, as Firo says, how can I spell it? Ah, H-O-O. A-Y, 
Uh, Harry, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Harry, yeah, okay. Harry. Harry says that it may be a sampling bias because the people are in the hospital, right? So definitely they have much more, you know, worrying about other people's uh, safety and they can see a lot of patients who got the, some, you know, bad result from motorcycle who didn't wear a helmet. So maybe they are biased on that issue, right? So they are more concerned about the safety. So definitely, yeah, it actually, it affects the result, right? So both of them, actually Grace's answer and Harry's answer, both are correct. So actually we don't know whether this statistics is, came from just random chance or from uh, sampling bias, right? So that's why we need to, yeah, deal with such a thing. And to, but in the usual cases, we cannot, you know, we cannot observe these parameters in user, right? Because it is a little bit almost impossible to get the parameters. So there are something called, uh, that's why we need to run about this competence interval. And to deal with this competence interval, first of all, we need to deal with this sampling distribution. So I said that we don't know about parameter, right? So to get the parameters a lot, then what we, what we can do is just do sampling a lot, right? So we can just do surveys a lot. And that's why this pipe 38, which I showed in the start of this lecture, just collect a lot of surveys about the uh, presidential election, right? Because we don't know uh, the actual parameter. We don't know whether Biden wins or Trump wins from one survey but maybe we can correct all such a surveys from other samples, then maybe we can have some, you know, correct answers, which is more, much more close to parameter, right? So, so these are called, the, the correction of such a experimental samples is called sampling distribution, and it is just distribution of values taken on by the statistics in all possible samples and the same size of from the same population, right? So for example, example 7.4. Okay, yeah, so this is also example about the politics. So we have population that has a 50% chance of voting for party X. So in this case, we already know that what the P is. So in here, our P is 50%. 100 voters were surveyed at random to ask if they would vote for party X. And the result was that 4,400 over 100 would vote for party uh, X. Of course, party X didn't like the results, so they do another survey that in that case, they can 57 over 100 would vote for party X. So these results are quite varied and they just repeat this eight more times to get such a sample statistics, right? So these numbers, are actually called the sampling distribution. And from this number and in the statistics, if you just do such a doing sample, uh, making a sample distribution again and again, so that you can just do sample a lot more than this, then it actually forms your normal distribution, right? And one thing we know about this sampling distribution is that if you just do the experiment again and again, so that if, if the number of experiment is greater than 30, then sampling distribution is approximately normal. So P hat is actually uh, just normal distribution. Form your normal distribution. And in case of this center, it is just P, which means that the Mean of this sampling is just, mean of P hat is just P parameter, right? 
and standard deviation of p hat is equal to square root of p times or minus p over n, right? So it means that if you just do sampling again and again, so infinitely many, you can you do the sampling and get the numbers, then their mean is actually the same as parameter and their standard deviation is actually also some number derived from some parameters, right? So that's why yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of actually researchers do a lot of surveys at once to get some concrete results up. Does it make sense? So rest theory is amplitude seven point six. So in this section, what you need to do is just can conclude about population and parameters from the samplings. So example 7.6 about uh, that for population with p is equal to 0 0.4, if we were to take sample of n is 100 over and over, then the mean of this sampling distribution would be p hat is equal to 0 0.4. So, so in that case, you can see that actually if, so if P is 0 0.4 and A is 100, then the standard deviation is square root of P times one minus P over N. So you can just plug in those values into the sigma, uh, into this formula to get the standard deviation, right? So in the actual exam, we will question you that if you know about what is P and what is N, what is the mean of the p hat or what is the standard deviation of the p hat? Like kind of questions in the exam, right? Okay. Do you have any other question? Okay, and next one is example 7.7. .7. A population has 25% who are smokers and a random sample of 200 people was asked if they smoke or not, right? So then what did you expect the result of sample to look like if the experiment was repeated many times? Then if it, the experiment is repeated many times, then it follows the uh, Loma distribution. So what we can expect is that in this case, the population has 25%. So sampling distribution looks like normal and its mean is 25%, right? 0.25. So if you just repeat such an experiment many times, then it looks like 0.25. And standard deviation at this case is, it is not six, but sigma. So in that case, it is 0 0.25 times one minus 0 0.25 over 250. So it is it should be divided by 200. Then what you can get is using calculator, the square root of 0 0.0009375. So it is 0 0.0006. So the so standard deviation is 0, 0, 0, 0. 0.0306. So maybe one sigma should be 0 0.28 something. And here is 0 0.22 something. And two sigma is 0 0.31 and 0 0.19. And three sigma is 0 0.34 and 0 0.16, so on, right? So these are the sampling, distrib sampling distribution. So, 
And if one sample returned the result that no one smoked, would you believe it? So if you just pick the sample, but it shows that the result is that no one is smoked, right? It means that actually this sample should be here, right? Because no one is smoked means that the population in the sample who smoke who are smoker is just zero percent, right? So definitely the result should be here. But you know, this one at zero is definitely less than minus three sigma, right? So in that case, it is hardly to believe, right? Because yeah, even if it is inside of here, then maybe it, it was believable, but if you just get some sample, which it has the, no one is smoker in the sample, then in that case, it difficult to happen, right? So that's why we do not believe it at this point, right? No, because zero is less than the mu minus three sigma, which is 0.16. So it means that the sample happens with 0.15% because you know mu minus three sigma to mu plus three sigma takes the 99.7%. So this kind of sample happens in a chance of only 0.150%, right? So that's why we cannot, it is hard with this, right? Does it make sense? Yes, technically possible, that's very highly unlikely. That's good for expression. Wow. Thank you very much. Technically possible, but highly unlikely. Yeah. Yes, the father from the middle is less likely. So likewise, if you got the, some sample, and this sample shows that 100% is a smoker, and it is also hardly believable, right? It is technically possible, but highly unlikely, right? Because they are, it is also very, far from the middle, which is 0 0.25, right? Do you have any other question on this example? Good. And this kind of concept can be, you know, made it more precisely, and that's why we say this confidence interval. So from the example, we know that yeah, so sometimes our sample, uh, we don't know phi, but our sample is highly likely or not from the based on parameter, right? But instead, we can actually choose that if we have a sample, we don't know the population or we don't know the parameter, then we can actually infer that our parameter is inside of some interval, which is determined by the sample, right? So, in the statistics, if just think about that, choose the simple random survey of size n from a large population that contains an unknown proportion p, which is parameter of success, right? So in that case, 
the 95% confidence interval for phi is approximately p hat plus minus two times square root of this one. So instead of just remembering this uh, formula, just think about it. So we already know that if you have the sampling distribution, then our uh, mean is p, right? This is our mean. This is sampling distribution. So for p hat, and our mean is our parameter p, and our sigma. Oh, sorry. Sigma minus sigma uh, plus sigma and minus sigma and sigma is determined by square root of p times or minus p over n, right? So that's what we have from the previous section. So from this, instead just take, you just do the some sample, right? You just take the sample from the simple random study then definitely it is just chosen from one point in this sampling distribution, right? Randomly. So you can just choose some point it here, right? And then, so taking a sample is just the same as choose a point in the sampling distribution. And we know that actually, from 68, 95, 99, 7% rule, some number minus two sigma from to some number plus two sigma takes 95%, right? So some number minus one sigma to some number plus one sigma just takes 68%, and some number minus two sigma to some number plus two sigma takes 95%, and so on, right? So if you just pick some sample for here and just take the two sigma, p hat plus two sigma, and sorry, and p hat minus two sigma in here, then it means that actually your p, your p should be inside of this one is 95%, right? So in the 95% of probability, your p should be inside of here, right? Likewise, if you just choose any other p, p hat, if for example, if you just some very highly unlikely p hat in here, then maybe in case of 95%, your P should be inside of here, right? So in case that you just choose your P hat, which is highly a likely point, so example, maybe if you could just choose P hat, which is highly unlikely on here, or if you choose P hat on here, then maybe your P is not inside of this interval, but in usual cases, in case of 95%, your P should be inside of this interval, right? So this is called the confidence interval. I know this is difficult concept, so I will repeat it in the next lecture, but what I mean is that instead of thinking about taking a sample, so we can just thinking about that get a sample is just the same as choose a point in the sampling distribution. And whenever you choose the sampling distribution p hat, then this should be inside of this, um, yeah, they have some 95% of intervals in this, right? And if your p hat is too highly unlikely, is not too highly unlikely, then your p parameter should be inside of this interval, right? 
So in case PI is not in this, this side or not in this side, always your P is inside of this interval, right? So that this interval is called confidence interval. And at, we can assure that in 95%, when we take the two sigma and 95%, we can assure that actually this P is inside of the interval, even if we don't know what the P is, right? That's the method of confidence interval. And I'll explain it further in the next time. And I will do some review on the next time. So please take the lecture in the review. And thank you very much for today. Do you have any, if you have any question, please let me know. So, pardon? Yes, it is kind of guidelines that we can use. Yes, that's correct. Yes, uh, Hannah, I, so in the next time we will have a review because 7.8 is actually last section of this chapter. And so in the remaining time, I just uh, serve some exercises for you to, which you can prepare for the exam next week, right? Yes, it is, I think that it is in last section. Yeah, it is the last section for the exam. So we will, in the exam one, we, uh, exam two, we will have chapter five, six, and seven that are covered in the exam two. All right. Okay. I was okay. last mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, same for this case. Great. Thank you. What is this week due? Pardon? What is this week due? Uh, due is just uh, midnight of the Thursday. Okay. Great. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do you have any other question in the Zoom? Okay, then let's end the session. And if you have any other question, please let me know. Yeah, email.